Welcome to Paper Quest. I'm Jesse. And I'm James. And we're two friends teaming up in our ongoing quest through the Infinite Library. During a main quest, we discuss our current buddy book, and during a side quest, we share our recent solo reads with each other. You can follow us on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, and TikTok. Please rate, like, or subscribe wherever you're listening, and check out the show notes for all the links in the description. Check the Facebook page for our upcoming release schedule, and consider supporting the show with our $1 Patreon, which also grants access to each episode two days early. But for now, please join us in another episode. This is Paper Quest. Okay, so today is going to be our part two and final part of our fave book swap. We did... You know what? I already switched. switched. We did switch, which is your favorite book. Uh, last uh, last main quest. Today we're doing Fable Haven, which I haven't read since. I I still can't decide if it's middle school or high school, like early high school, but long enough ago that I can't remember. So I will start with a, a book summary, followed by, of course, why I picked this book, why I like this book, and uh, we will go from there. So. Fable Haven by Brandon Mole. And this one I just wrote myself. I didn't pull this from anything. Because I don't like the regular book description. <laughs> so, when their parents are forced to leave on a trip, Kendra and Seth Sorensen are begrudgingly dropped off at their grandparents' home, an old yet beautiful estate on a very large piece of land. Grandpa Sorensen seems to have many rules to keep them safe, and Grandma Sorensen is nowhere to be found. They are told not to enter the barn or to ever cross into the woods. However, the inevitable curiosity of young children will soon reveal secrets to their grandparents' home quicker than grand, uh, Grandpa expected. This is Fablehaven, secretly housing magical creatures from all around the world, keeping the creatures safe from humans and vice versa. The Sorensen children quickly get mixed up into a dangerous plot involving an imprisoned witch, the secret to their grandmother's whereabouts, hints of a secret society with nefarious purposes, and the race to prevent an ancient creature from awakening. Uh, so this book, what do you think? Are we thinking, is this like an 8 to 12 range again on age? I think so. I think that's what it was. Um, but I think can be highly enjoyed by adults uh, of any age. I still very much enjoyed this read. And I have already finished the second book. And I will be doing the rest. So... Um, I've mentioned this before in podcasts, and there's a certain word that I want to use that I keep Googling and I cannot find it, and it's driving me crazy. But there is a definition for when a book takes place in a singular location, mm. you know, in a home, on a train, in a plane, etc. I cannot find the word, and it's driving me crazy because I used to know in it. In a boat with a goat. But for the most part, yeah. <laughs> so for the most part, this book takes place in a singular location kind of cheating because it's a big location but it's a singular setting it's a house on a piece of land there's woods there's there's places to go here on the property but when a book is like that i'm always a sucker for it i like when you can just stay in one place and really build out this story and get involved and like feel like the place we're at is a character in and of itself mm -hmm. which is always very cool to me i kind of get that you know when you read i know at least for me i'm sure for you you know when you read like Harry Potter or something similar and you feel the magical vibes? Mm -hmm. I, I get that feeling in this book too. Like I feel excited to read it. I like the world building. I like the the hints of things to come and what may be out there. They do drop a lot of little things that don't get brought up again. Like you know this secret society that they um, mention a few times is obviously going to play a bigger role. You have no idea like what their deal is and stuff like that. And then just just the property of Fablehaven itself. I mean, I know this book has its childish moments. It's funny. But Fablehaven itself is cool. It feels lived in. It feels ancient. Like, they'll come across things and it's like, how long has that been there? Thousands of years? You know? Like, we'll talk about the witch, which is kind of a main character in this book. So, I just, I just feel it all through and through. Back in the day when I first read it, I would give it a 5 out of 5. Having read it today, I did sort of update myself and i'm giving it four out of five stars but i will uh i will hand it off to you on your spoiler free thoughts and then we'll jump into whatever we want to jump into sounds good uh so i really didn't know anything about the book until you 
read the summary last time um, from the back of the book, I was just like, all right, this is James's choice. I, I'm reading it either <laughs> way, so it didn't really matter. Um, and it was fun. It was, I, I did also give it a four out of five. Uh, it's not something that I would read a hundred times, but it's something that I really enjoyed. It was a really quick read, which we all know I love. I love something that you can just like yep. sit down, get into, and um, kind of blow through it and feel connected to, like you said, to the, the property of Fablehaven, to the generational story um, with the grandparents and the, the grandchildren. And then also you really get to see that um, Seth is a ridiculous little boy who wants to go on adventures and that his sister is clearly the older <laughs> child. Like, no, you, you can't do that. You, you know, did you even pack underwear type of thing? And yeah, yeah it just feels uh, authentic in their relationship. It's loving. It's it's silly. It's. Um, competitive and then also that very bantery very like yeah you know giving giving each other crap which yeah yeah, well and also it feels real enough that it almost could exist Mm -hmm. um which i appreciate it's not like you know they the children live in the real world and then they find this place and they're like hold on (laughs) what (laughs) um so yeah, I really enjoyed it. I immediately was trying to convince my 10-year-old to read it. Um, he realized very quickly that there was no pictures, and or there's a couple, but not enough for him at, at this point in his reading journey. And he was just <laughs> kind of like, yeah, no, I'm good. But I think in like a year or two, um, because he has some interest in some other books, he might decide to read it. So I'm going to keep on him about that. Does he ever... Does he ever come across as someone who might be more of an audiobook kind of kid? Yeah, he does have a children's audiobook app, and he's been listening to um, Harry Potter and something else. So he's, yeah, okay. he's a very moving kid. So <laughs> him mm-hmm. sitting down to read something for more than five minutes is, well, t- he reads for 20 minutes a day, but it's a lot for him. So we're going to keep working on it. Yeah. Yeah, because I I feel like I was, I mean, I just straight up was ADHD when I was a kid and just, I was a big reader still, but there was always times where I was like, how fast can I read this? I want to move on to the next thing. And, you know, I just, so to have, I mean, even to this day, I do audiobooks and I speed it Mm -hmm. up, right? Like, that's multi-purpose. I also want to get through more books for the podcast, but I also think uh, um, narrators talk really slow in books by by nature. Um, But yeah, no, that's cool. I hope one day he does read it. As far as what we are going to get into, do you want to just talk about some of the characters? Here, I'll start with this. Let's start with the two kids because... Are we going to spoilers? I love both... Um, what's are that? Are we going to spoilers? Yeah, unless you have any other spoiler-free thoughts, we'll call it spoilers right. from here. I just want to make sure. <laughs> I didn't, okay, I yeah, didn't want to assume and then say something that spoiled things. So, yes, let's start with nope, the kids. No, you're good. Yeah, we will... Um, so, Seth and Kendra... So, Seth is a really good character, but he is also very frustrating. He's younger, and he will make multiple mistakes in this book. Um, But I will say, having read further, um, that becomes part of the story. He he makes some pretty big mistakes in this book. So, you'll see the fallout of that in later books, and sort of like having to learn from his mistakes. So, as annoying as it was in this book, especially with Midsummer's Eve or whatever... Were you, like, angry every time Seth did something wrong? No. <laughs> like, every time? No, I wasn't angry. I think it's what a... I, do they say his age? I assumed him to be 8, 9, 10 years old, somewhere in there. I don't remember. All I know is in book two, Kendra is a couple months away from uh, freshman in, in high school. Okay, so, yeah. I. Um, it, It's a one year... So, whatever, this takes us one year before the second book, so... I'm assuming he must be middle school, like beginning of middle school, maybe. Okay, because... Maybe? I don't know. I assumed her to be about 13, 14. So if he's, you know, even if he's 10 or 11, I just took it as, you know, he has a good heart. And he he's does. an adventurous little boy. And he wants to, you know, 
fight the dragon and he wants to um, mm. capture the fairy and he wants to do all those things that kids want to do. Um, and he just happens to find himself in a place where he can actually do some of those things. So I, it didn't, it didn't anger me at all. It was, that is what a little kid is. And he pushes the boundaries of the, of the rules he's been given. Like how far can I push, yeah. you know, what is the edge of the woods really? How far can I push that definition and stuff like that? Well, and I, <laughs> I think that that's, you know, that is, that is who he is. If you say, you know, you can have one cookie, but don't explain why, uh, you know, he's, he's not going to listen. But if you say you can have one cookie because I made a whole cake and we're having that too, he'd be like, oh, mm-hmm. okay. But to just say, yeah. like, don't go in the woods, he's like, okay, but why? And I think he asks or, or one of them asks and they say ticks. And he's like, that's the stupidest thing. I have ever heard. Yeah. Um, but if they said, don't go in the woods because something's going to eat you, I think he'd be more hesitant to go in the woods. Yeah. I think grandpa makes mistakes too. Like he it's oh, it is, it is correct to withhold information. You can't just be like, Hey, guess what? I'm going to suck a crazy person and tell you that there is just wild, fantastical, you know, magical creatures in here. Cause they're not going right. to believe that automatically. Um, but at least say something like, I don't know, this is bear country, like, don't go in the woods. <laughs> yeah, it's not, <laughs> not that <ticks. laughs> hard to say. Or even just say, there's hunters. Like, that's n- yeah. super normal. <laughs> and then they'd be like, oh, yeah, like, people hunt in the woods. We don't want to get shot. Yeah. <laughs> so he's he's got his, uh, Grandpa's got his mistakes, too. But yeah. I think, you know, the kids, part of the stories of the kids were quite literally thrust upon him. Yeah. And even at the beginning of the book, when you hear, like, grandpa talking to mom or dad and he's like can't they come the week after or something because we're like oh why but then we learn this is a bad week because of midsummer's eve um but yeah he he could have done it differently but i think he was stressed out you know grandma's missing and he's got two kids who don't don't really know each other all that well they've never been to this house grandpa knows where grandma is (laughs) Oh, well, yeah, he does, yeah. <laughs> um, But he has to keep it a secret from everyone else. Right. And then you have Kendra, who is literally the polar opposite of her brother, who's afraid <laughs> yes. and a rule follower, and I understand and get her, but she's a little bit of a stick in the mud. Like, mm-hmm. he, you know, and probably because she has to make up for him being ridiculous. Um, and like you said, she's a little older, so has that older sister responsibility vibe yeah sometimes well especially Mm -hmm. figuring out when they're kind of left to their own devices within these boundaries like the grandpa's just like yeah i'm not gonna be around so stay here here and here and you know have fun (laughs) like there's no tv there's no nothing and they give uh kendra there's this really random treasure hunt of like, here are keys, figure out what they go yeah. to, which is kind of exciting. I was like, oh yeah, what is the point of all this? Like, why is this just busy work? But he's trying to get them used to the idea of something is going on here. But when you figure out something on your own, it's much more believable. Mm-hmm. So she has that going for her, but she's like, I don't want Seth to be a part of this. And also she keeps finding little chocolates in places and she's like, he doesn't get this. Yeah, she eventually <laughs> gives him a couple, but then like hides the rest. Mm-hmm. Yep, and then um, Grandpa is gone a lot, but there is Lena, which is like, I don't want to say housemate, like a caretaker, Lena the caretaker, yeah. and she's a fascinating story. Yeah, you know, she's a naiad. She's she's a naiad who, I guess, generations ago when she lived on this property, fell in love with a previous caretaker, and um, it's very hard to convince a naiad to leave the water because that's like a whole way of life they will live for years upon years upon years mm-hmm. but she fell in love and came out of the water and accepted aging i mean she ages at a much slower pace but she accepted aging in the human way and her story is kind of super sad by the end of this yeah i was really <laughs> upset that she uh, we're obviously jumping way ahead and, and jumping around but um you know they have this big battle and the the fairies return her to the water and she turns back into a naiad and doesn't remember uh, or doesn't seem to remember the, the life she lived as a mortal. Um, and I was really sad. I was hoping for some sort of glimpse of like she knew them. Uh, she knew 
Kendra, yeah. and yeah, it, it made me really upset. But I mean, yeah, it just hurts because the fairies think they're doing the right thing. They have to fix all the fable haven mistakes over the course of the night, and they think that's one of them. Oh, that's a naiad. She goes back to here, and it's like, no, don't do yeah. it. <laughs> like this one goes here, and this one yeah, goes here, and I fixed you. And th- it yep. was again, <laughs> it was done in with the best intentions. Yeah. But, um, and then we have Dale, who's also a caretaker. He's much less prevalent in the story. He's just kind he's kind of he's kind of farmhandish, yeah. kind of farmhand work. Yeah. Um, but there's definitely a mystery with him. Of his brother lives in a hut somewhere. I don't yes, remember the brother. So we have a the brother's name. There's an un, there's a character we never see. He's only name dropped a few times. His it's his Dale's brother is Warren. Warren, yeah. He he has he used to be a normal person, but for some reason he walked out of the woods one day, um, and was like catatonic, albino, completely white, and he just kind of exists. Like yeah, he's his brother takes care of him off screen. Yeah, and um, he was upset because when the fairies were fixing everything, they didn't fix his brother. Um, so because he wasn't around. Yeah, so I'm interested to know, and I may read more of the stories, but I want to know more about that character because it definitely left like, you know, like you said earlier, there's a lot of things that are touched, and I'm like, well, we never got back to that. Like, <laughs> nope, nope. And if you are interested, you will get to that storyline directly in book two. So that would be the very next thing if you're interested. And each book. Like, all the hints are dropped in book one. And book one, as we know, is not... It, it's a it's a quick book. Mm-hmm. A couple hundred pages. And that's a couple hundred kid pages. Yeah, big you know, letters. Bigger <laughs> words, bigger spaces. Um, but I made the comparison to Harry Potter a lot, not because the stories are similar, but because the vibe is similar. So every book gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And the fifth book is, like, twice the size, if not more, of the first book. And you can imagine if they're only jumping a year or so at a time, they're pretty old by the yeah. end. Like they're going to grow up in this series. Cause in book three, um, Kendra's going to be in high school. Right. So it's like, it's just, you kind of grow up with it. It never becomes as adult as like the seventh Harry Potter book, but it does grow up. And there is a sequel series that just ended this year. Um, that is still Seth and Kendra. And I don't, I, I don't, they must be young adults by that point in the series. So, uh, if you feel like the first one is too childish, I can tell you having just finished the second one, it's already starting to grow up. That's really cool. I do appreciate when um, authors acknowledge that the characters have to evolve because a child who is eight is not going to have the same feelings and thoughts. You know, they're they're more formed by 18 or however many years. Yeah. So, um who what other characters are on your list i really just kind of those are the main characters we talk about I mean, we can get the grandma in a second she's like part of the plot really mm-hmm. you have hugo the golem you have the fairy queen who even though it doesn't make a real appearance is still very fascinating mm-hmm. um you have the two satyrs who <laughs> i liked them i love to hate they're just annoying you know trying to get away with things you know they want batteries for their tv because tv is is banned and they're just like oh, okay these are these are the satyrs <laughs> i liked them i thought that they were yeah you know you're in this big grandpa and lena have been taken they're being chased by something they've entered the woods they've seen the witch they're doing all these things and then there's just these two satyrs who are like you got any double you know whatever c batteries or whatever size they were <laughs> And they're like, yeah. not on us. Like, we don't just carry batteries. <laughs> yeah. Um, Sicy batteries. Yeah. So I thought that they were fun. I definitely could see, like, if this was a, a children's movie, them popping in and getting some really big laughs of just like, that was our that was our soup. Like, you now we got to get a new thing mm-hmm. to get our soup and it being a whole situation. So I enjoyed them. Well, and... Don't quote me on this because I haven't looked at it in a while. I, I'm not actively checking, but Fable Haven at one point, or maybe still is, something was supposed to happen with the Fable Haven show, movie, mm. something that was in the works at one point. I don't know that I haven't heard that since just before COVID, so I don't know if that put anything on hold. But I, I would want this to be like a Netflix show yeah. or something. Yeah. Um. 
So, kind of the catalyst for the book, which both is and isn't Seth's fault. Again, he, he makes a mistake, but he captures a fairy. Then the fairies take... Um, revenge. Yeah, yeah. So, the fairies take revenge on Seth for stealing one of their kind and accidentally holding it overnight, turning it into an imp. And he's turned into, like, a Walrus. weird seal monster yeah. thing. Yeah. And they they have a solution. They're like, okay, well, there's this witch in the woods, and she is powerful enough to heal you, but we have to, like, make a deal with her. And there's these knots, these magical knots, no matter how hard the witch tries, she can't undo. It's her magical binding. So they release one of the knots, and the witch is like, one step closer. One day I'll get them to do all these knots. They're going to need me again. They turn Seth back into a, a human child, and then later on in the story, Grandma, who is a chicken, yep. because of reasons, <laughs> um, they can fix her, and she tells she can she basically points me to the witch. The witch can help me, and the kids are like, "But if we go to the witch, she's gonna be free. It's the last knot or whatever." But grandma doesn't know, and Grandma is like, "That's okay. You can do it." But she doesn't realize they just used one of those knots, so she's like, "Well, <laughs> this is a mess." So the witch gets free. And we very quickly learn about a lot of things. So, not so much in this order, but there are... This is Fablehaven. That's the name of this specific sanctuary. There are other places like Fablehaven scattered throughout the world. A lot of them are public um, as far as, like, if you if you know about it, you know about mm-hmm. it. But five of them are secret, and nobody, even in the know, knows their locations. And these five all hold a key of some sort. Not a literal key, but a key of some sort that holds the power to unlock um, the demon prison or whatever. And that's, um, I can't remember the name right now, but there's the demon prison and Fablehaven is one of those. And they're also holding uh, Bahamut. Is that the mm-hmm. one in this one? The bad guy Bahamut. So anyways, there is, they meant they, they, they name drop, like there's five keys and there's, they're each hidden on a different property. Um, I don't again, even think that storyline. I don't even think they call them keys. I just think in this first one they say that there's like something hidden, and Grandma yes. doesn't know okay. what it is, but she knows it's hidden and it's important, and that's kind and of. And then it. they just drop yeah. it, so we just know like okay, there's something hidden on the property. Um, so that'll get that'll come into play in later books with the society with everything else, but this place holds. Um, an ancient beast who has been locked away the same way the witch has been locked away. And so the witch's whole deal is like, now I'm going to go free that thing. Well, and, and she makes, before we get yeah. into all of that, um, the Midsummer's Eve party happens and, Oh yeah, yeah, the, yeah. That's, the kids are yeah. told like, go lock yourself in the attic room, which has been set up for you. It has extra guards Put in earplugs. Don't look out the window. Don't open the window. Stay in your bed, which has, you know, got salt around it to protect you. And, of course, Seth being Seth wants to hear it. He's like, well, that sounds like a dragon. That sounds like this. And um, they do. He he hears a crying baby. Yeah, they do look. And it's, like, almost a non-issue. Like, she she makes him stop and they sit back down. But then they start hearing this crying baby. And um, they're calling to them asking for help and they both look out and they see a pack of werewolves about to eat this toddler that's on the roof and they're like how to get on the roof what's it doing there maybe it's lost maybe it's parents or somewhere Mm -hmm. um and they reach they open the window reach out to grab the baby it's not a baby obviously and the wolves and things come in um and dale you know has to burst in the room and, and shoot them and um luckily they grab grandma chicken that they don't know is grandma yet <laughs> and <laughs> and jump back in the salt and the salt like uh you know sparks and and hurts the the bad guys when they try and cross over it um but seth very quickly realizes like oh this was really bad um and then the rest of the night you know they stay in the bed together with with the chicken and they hear babies calling to them saying, you know, Seth, please help me, help me, help me, crying, screaming, being ripped apart. And they were told, stay in there until we come get you, until it's light out. So it becomes light out and no one comes and gets them. And so they go out of the room 
they walk out, they, you know, they're looking, opening all the doors. No one's there that they expect to be there. They go outside. Dale's a statue on the ground. Yep. Um, and Lena and Grandpa are gone. And that's when they realize that Grandma's the chicken. And they unchicken her. We never find out. I don't know if it's in the second. Um, but they never explain why she was a chicken. Just that she is. <laughs> And they will explain that later. I, I assumed. Um, but that was one of those yeah. things of like, I would love to know more about how she got herself into being a chicken. Um, and yeah, so then they convince grandma to take them with her to save the day. And that's kind of where we fall and this in. Is what, this is what I appreciate about books like this or authors like this. I've read many a children's book where the very young kid is the main character and he's way too adult. Like yeah. he can do so much on his own. He's not scared. This book is like realistic. These are kids. We are going to put them in positions where they will be on their own and have to solve things. But they need adults in their lives, and the adults will help them. Whether it's Grandma or Dale or what have you, they can't do everything. I, like yeah. I'm glad that pa- parents are involved. Well, not parents. I'm glad the adults are involved. Like they, they know. Like these kids aren't slaying any insane 99 level monster it's like well there has to be adults in this book and i think i think kendra was a great example of that because she like we said earlier was much more fearful much less um willing to run headlong into into these situations and when everything is falling apart and she's looking like she's the only one who's going to be left over she has this moment of like we're all gonna die and Mm-hmm. it is what it is and I need to how am I going to tell my parents and how am I going to like she she gives in and is like this is it um, only to you know kind of remember like oh yeah there's there's this queen that I think Lena had just kind of glossed over in her story it wasn't like she knew a lot about it and just kind of went with her intuition of like someone's going to help me um and yeah, yeah, it was all very realistic of like not just the actions she ended up taking, but her mental process of they're hungry. They, you know, they want a, they're thirsty. They are scared. They are um, making decisions at age appropriate levels. They're not like, oh, let me go sort this out and strategically make this plan. And like, yeah. Yeah, they're winging it, and and she and the bravest thing Kendra has to do because she's kind of like the catalyst for the end game. The bravest thing has she has to do, which don't get me wrong, is still brave and still hard. Mm-hmm. But all she has to do is take a boat and cross the lake where the naiads live, who are dangerous, so that she can make a request to the fairy queen. That is her. I have no adults moment. This is how I save the day. And that's and that's not some epic thing. She just had to do this very fearful thing. Of getting past the naiads and their luring, like siren way, like come to the water and get closer, and it's like okay, that makes logical, realistic sense. That is a scary thing for a kid to do, and then she made her request to the fairy queen statue, and then that's when the fairies can help, when the adults can get free, and we can save the day. Well, and that felt realistically doable. And she she crosses back over and she sees the witch's puppet um, golem, Mindigo. Yeah. And he's, I just picture him as like a big marionette. Is that? Yeah, literally that's exactly what it is. And it's not like she gets in some epic fist fight with him. She pulls, she unclips his arm because he's a puppet. Yeah. <laughs> like, and gets tricked into the water. Yeah, yeah. The naiads take him. Um, yep. So she's, but you know, there's times where like this teen girl is gonna, um, I don't know if you saw it, but like Enola Holmes on YouTube with Millie Bobby Brown. I yeah. loved it. It was great. But Millie Bobby Brown at, you know, pretending to be 15, 14 or 15 is not having, it's not realistic for her to be having a full on physical fight with a, an adult man with a gun. It's <laughs> not. You, it's not going to happen. Yeah. Um, and I felt like the physical fight, quote unquote, that she has with this puppet was totally acceptable she was like oh wait this is a doll (laughs) like let me take him apart and trick him because he has no brains he's just 
ordered to do something and does it. Um, so yeah, I appreciated that. And again, no hate to Millie Bobby Brown or that movie. I'm very excited for the second one. <laughs> one thing that was super fantastical that's not super related directly to the plot, but that I want to talk about for a second is this ginormous cow. <laughs> this, they have a. This is one of those moments where I was like, "Oh, this is one of those weird parts of the book where I'm like, uh, <laughs> it's kind of." <laughs> I don't. Do you remember her name? The cow's name. Oh, did the cow have a name? I don't remember. Yeah, I think the cow did have a name. Um, but basically, they like like you mentioned, they're not allowed to go in the barn. They everything happens. There's no adults, and they hear this like rumbling or crying or the sound and yeah, like, like a monstrous noise like oh god what is yeah, that yeah <laughs> so of course they walk straight to it as you do and mm -hmm. they come to find this cow that is the size of a barn yeah like literally it's outgrowing its own barn yeah. um and they <laughs> they jump off ladders to help milk it and relieve her pain which is why she was crying they make a giant mess, and they clean it up with a hose, which was all great. Very responsible. Seems a little silly when you're in the <laughs> middle of saving the day, but whatever. Um, <laughs> and yep. I, I laughed. I thought it was ridiculous, but also, like, it was just so random. And uh, Kendra has to go back and get some milk from the cow to save the day because uh, the fairy queen is And like, if you're listening to this review having not read the book, the milk... Is drunk. It's a magical cow. Oh, yes, you drink yes. the milk, then you can see the magic of Fablehaven. All of a sudden, the you see the butterflies aren't butterflies; they're fairies. Blah blah blah. Just in case you're, you know, just listening. For yeah, fun. it's it's <laughs> kind of like, and again, we use Harry Potter a lot, but it's kind of like how Luna wears those glasses and she can see things floating around. The Nargles. Yeah, <laughs> this is the milk is their version of the glasses of like all of a sudden you see everything for what it really is. Yeah. So, yeah, it was just fun and silly, and I enjoyed that part a lot and just thought it was so ridiculous. Yeah, the ridiculous moment for me, um, which that was one of them, but I forgot about the second one, which is where they have to give, a, I think it was a troll, the massage. Yes. <laughs> which, out of context, sounds like, okay, so this is a book you're getting four out of five stars, but they, they're making deals, and they have nothing to bargain with. But, you know, a troll being a troll and how they live, Grandma is trying to convince him, like, you will remember this for the rest of your life. Mm -hmm. Like, this is a great... And he's like, well, it's not something physical that I can, like, take. It's yeah, because just one hour of you doing something. Trolls and want then... <laughs> goals. They want, they want things. You yeah. Know? Things for passage. Yeah. Um... <laughs> that was my ridiculous moment of, like... And they are now massaging a troll after, like, what was a very long debate of, like, what do we <laughs> give you? I remember there was, in that scene, I don't exactly remember what it was, but he was, she was like, you know, I'll give you this massage. And he's like, well, what if you stay 12 years as my personal masseuse? And I just remember <laughs> laughing so hard of, like, the he's putting the the bargain up so high and she's just like well i, I you know how about no <laughs> like, it, it was just great because they were at such odds of like you know i don't know how how about you know how about you give me a diamond and they're like here how about a pebble <laughs> and then they have to talk up this pebble of how great it is and how amazing and how he should want it and then he's like you know what yeah I do want that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All, all these magical creatures, they live their own way of lives, and they don't realize the demands they make of regular people are just outlandish. They're like, you realize how you sound, right? Like, this is not how the world works. Hey. <laughs> like, it's just ridiculous. Use it, use it to your advantage. <laughs> so they, of course, save the day and uh, learn lots of lessons and then have to go back to real life, which sounds so ridiculous. Like... I there's no way I could go back after that. Yeah, they spend the very beginning of the f second book in like regular life and like so f Kendra at the end becomes fairy struck. So oh, the yes. fairies all like kiss her basically. I'm um, at the end of the day. It's like how they all that's how they turn back and stuff, yep. right? So they they kiss yeah. her on the and cheek then... and they turn small again because her deal with the fairy queen made them into a big 
army, basically, that like big physically. Yep. Uh, they they become human sized. They're bigger, and they can um, they take command from her. So she leads a another instance whole of army. the magical creatures save the day. You know, yeah. it wasn't kids fighting in an army. It was the magical creatures. The kids just executed the the, the first step yeah. there. But so she doesn't need milk anymore. For all future purposes, she sees magic for what it is, and. That will come into play because what happens when you leave Fable Haven? Well, now you can see things you didn't realize during everyday life. So, which is a very interesting aspect. This makes me think of, and I think maybe if we swap books again, maybe this will be the book that I choose. But it makes me think of Sean and McGuire's Wayward Children series, which I've mentioned, where you have the kids who have gone to Narnia or down the rabbit hole or whatever, and then they come back and they have to acclimate to something that they know is not one it's not their home and two it's you know they they just spent years being a mermaid or they just were a king in another realm and now they're like a 10 year old who has to just go to school yeah and be normal narnia did that they were kings and queens for decades they grew up, grow old together, yeah. and they come home and they're ten again. It's like, oh shoot! Like, yeah, and then they're like, <laughs> I, getting I would love to book swap and, that. Yeah, I think that would be a really fun. That one. sounds amazing. Um, but okay. it, that's what it makes me think of is like they just went through all of these things, and learned a lot, and now they have to go back to school, and to high yep. school and middle school and kids on the playground and all of those things. And it's like you just went through a literal. Uh, what's the right word? Like supernatural war, <laughs> and yep. unleashed a witch into the world, and your grandma was a, was a chicken, and now you have to do homework and chores. It's just yeah, yeah. I, I would just want to die. Yeah. <laughs> it's one of those things of like, I kind of want just a whole book of that. Like, give me like a year in between of like, like maybe a couple years of like the summers with the grandparents or what I you know some whatever that is. And then, like, just a year of them at school. <laughs> like, I would read that. Well, they... Now, to be clear, I've only read the Fable Haven 5 book series. Mm -hmm. The sequel series is called Dragon Watch. It's another five books that just ended. Um, I have no idea what that's about. I can guess based on the title. But, um, so, just speculating here... Grandpa makes it pretty clear they're like, one day we are old, yeah. we're going to die, and someone else needs to be caretakers. Basically, it's like so an audition. So I assume, yeah, so I assume, I don't know how old they are in Dragon Watch, but maybe they're already the caretakers at that point. I have no idea, but that'd be really cool. Yeah. But I, I would like to see what they, I mean, I've seen a little bit of it, but I would like to see how they like long term just like deal with real life. Like the like, like book 1.5. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm definitely interested. Like I said, I will probably keep reading. Um and they're so fast, so I think... Yeah, they break things up, because we're about to dive into yeah. this. Uh, well, I, I'm in some big books, but um, our next buddy read is, our main quest book is a big old chunky Stephen King. It is. <laughs> it is. I'm excited. And I'm glad that Fablehaven was the short book this last two weeks, because I started a my own, my own book on my own time. I started a book that was like, 600 pages and it's um i needed all the time to get through i have a few chapters left but i was like thank god because i did not realize how big this book was yeah um anything else on fable haven uh i don't know if we'll talk about the future fable haven books anytime soon so i would just say i finished book two and i gave that one a five out of five and i think it's twice as good as the first book like first book like learning experience he was probably just trying to get his story together and you know as one does you learn as you as you yeah. write and continue your your story and i think they just approve upon every aspect of what this book is so well and and the second book is called rise of the evening star and that's the secret society that they name drop a few times in the first book so that kind of gives you an idea of where this series is headed i guess i'm going shopping because I enjoyed it. Like, I, I want to keep reading. I want to know why Grandma's a chicken. And um, I I just, I like the old people banter of, like, I can't believe you ate my eggs. Like, things like that. Mm -hmm. It was just, it was all, it was cute and fun. And 
Um, I have a couple books I've mentioned in previous podcasts that I'm trying to read this fall that are all very heavy and very, uh, you know, on, on theme for October and I need some, some silly (laughs) in between. So, so something to note, if you have been following along with our schedule, which is posted on Facebook, um, we made some updates because we do have these big chunky books coming. So we've taken some books out, rearranged some books and dates. So go check that out so that you can read along with us if if that is what you enjoy doing uh, because we needed more time because these books are ginormous. <laughs> yeah, we, we're, we'll update our schedule now and again. Right now, we're probably going to we're probably going to change some some things around and do two main quests a month that gives us more time for, on our own books. So if you were looking forward to listening about um, the graveyard book, we are still going to discuss that. It just will be in a side quest coming up at some point soon. Yeah. Um, so that's still coming. No worries. And then on our on our side quests, we'll probably pick a number of books so that we have something even to talk about. Like you talk about two, I talk about two, or maybe it's three or something. Who knows? Um, but just books that we, we want to discuss. Maybe we don't review every single book because like last last week, I reviewed a one-star book that I couldn't even finish. Right. So, um, and I don't want to sit there and talk bad about an author all day long, but we'll just talk about like these are three books I really want the world or our 10 listeners to know about (laughs) we want your mom to know about (laughs) yes (laughs) so we'll just stick to the ones we want to want to discuss or excited to discuss and not necessarily like are you know gonna drag us down uh so next main quest pretty set in stone stephen king's fairy tale um very briefly have you read stephen king before i have read one stephen king book i don't remember what it was called i read it in high school um And I read it because the main character's name was Jesse. And that was literally the only reason. And I am, we've mentioned, I am a big baby. I get scared watching Pretty Little Liars. I get scared watching uh, commercials. Um, (laughs) So I'm nervous. I've never heard that before. (laughs) I'm nervous, but I'm excited. I am not a big horror fan as far as books. They don't do anything for me. Um, I have read Stephen King, and I'll talk more about this on the next episode, but um, I've read his Dark Tower series, but that is the extent of my Stephen King, and that was more fantasy than it was horror, which is why I read it, and I'm kind of hoping we have the same vibe here, so I just pulled up Amazon because I did not have this written out yet, and most of this is going to be new for me, so here we go. Charlie Reed looks like a regular high school kid great at baseball and football, a decent student, but he carries a heavy load. His mom was killed in a hit-and-run accident when he he was 10, and grief drove his dad to drink. Charlie learned how to take care of himself and his dad. When Charlie is 17, he meets a dog named Radar and her aging master, Howard Bowditch, a recluse in a big house at the top of a big hill with a locked shed in the backyard. Sometimes, strange sounds emerge from it. Charlie starts doing jobs for Mr. Bowditch and loses his heart to Radar. Then, when Bowditch dies, he leaves Charlie a cassette tape telling a story no one would believe. What Bowditch knows and has kept secret all his long life is that inside the shed is a portal to another world. Um, Okay, and then it just goes into accolades, it looks like. So, that's, yeah, that's about what I was hoping for. Sounds like a Narnia... You know, wardrobe situation. Yeah, so I'm, in. I'm here for it. I'm in. I didn't know what it was about. So I'm, now I'm intrigued more, much more. I still expect Stephen King twists and horror bits here and there. I don't think it's going to be, you know, Narnia elementary by any means, but <laughs> yeah, I, uh, I look forward to I it. I definitely feel like this is going to be one of those ones where I have to like close it and walk away to like compose myself and uh, get really cozy and get through some some scenes because like i said i get scared of a lot of things (laughs) let us know what you think of fable haven if you are going to read it if you have read it uh check out facebook because i did just this week or last week depending when you hear this i updated that schedule uh so if you're following along we did make i think one or two changes all the books are still there we're just kind of spreading things out more yep Absolutely. 
All right. Anything on your end? No. I'm excited to go do some reading. Same. All right. Well, we will talk to you next time then during our upcoming side quests. Until then, bye. Bye.